Welcome to the Miracle Bridge. I am a professional board certified hypnotist, a heart math coach, and a master health NLP practitioner. I am also the author of the book, The Miracle Bridge. I've spent over 25 years working in the subconscious mind. I am a specialist at showing you how to identify and eliminate the hidden nuances in your perception that sabotage and undermine your life. Come learn how to transform your pain and frustration into healing and understanding. Please join me and my guests as we explore the vast world of healing through the subconscious mind. Today I have my guest, Heather Kirby. Heather, I'd like to thank you for coming today. You're um, welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you. Heather and I um, have, have a history. Um, she's one of my previous clients, um, also a previous employee um, at, at our wellness center. And we had some good times there, didn't we, Heather? We did. We helped a lot of people. Yeah. And um, I, I really like your story. It's, it's very similar to Lindsay's podcast, which is a previous one we did. And um, where you came in as a client first and the changes were impactful in your life. They changed your life. And, and you wanted to stay there and work with us. And you ended up really being a, a significant contributor to to the amazing um, work that, that we witnessed. And so I wanna just thank you for being a part of that. Thank you, it was. It was something I wanted to help spread the news about because it changed my life significantly. Yeah, well, Heather, um, maybe for our listeners, maybe first of all, you could, you could talk a little bit about um, where you were at in your life when, when we first met. So when I came to Mike, um, I was in a really dark place. Um, I was, I had been trying for a long time to kind of handle my depression and anxiety. Um, I had tried medication with mixed results, but mostly a lot of side effects that weren't worth whatever little benefit I got. And um, I had tried, you know, different places, living different places, living, um, tried different jobs and it didn't seem to matter where I went or what I did. The depression anxiety just would kind of eventually take over. And often it seemed like if I was being successful, it would come on even stronger, like almost sabotaging me. And Mm -hmm. I got to the point that I just kind of had given up. I um, knew I was in a bad place. So I told my family, my parents, and I said, because I I'd had some stuff in the past too, where it had had gotten kind of sketchy and had to be hospitalized. And, um, and so I let my family know. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm holding on. I'm like, but I can just barely make it through the day. I wasn't, I'd had to leave my job. I was really sick. I was throwing up every day. Um, I just was so, so depressed and, um, didn't think I was going to make it. And I, and I told my mom and I said, you know, I don't, I don't know if there is anything that could even can help me. I don't know what to do because I'm just getting through the day, just keeping myself alive. And that's all I can do right now. And she said, well, let me look into some things. Let me do some research. And she did some research and found out about the Theta Wellness Center and um, specifically the one that Mike was at, because one of the things that had helped me in the past was hypnosis. And so we were very curious about the hypnotherapy. And um, Mike used to do these free classes at the clinic um, where you could come and ask questions and talk to him and hear him talk and kind of get a feel of, does this feel like something that appeals to you? Does this feel like something that sounds right? And so we went to that. And during that discussion, I started to feel the like little tiny seed of hope sprouting up inside of me again. Like I, I felt the spirit and felt kind of like this was something I ought to do and try. And it was a big commitment um, to do the, the full program. Um, so I, I wanted to do one session with Mike first. And I can't remember if we, I don't think we even did hypnosis the first time. I think okay. we just did neuro-linguistic pro- programming. But I was amazed at how Mike, not knowing me, um, but having the skills of being able to read body language and being able to read, um, you know, kind of what I was saying like behind the scenes, like, cause you, you say things, but your brain has programs. 
And he could very quickly cut like what would usually take me with a therapist, like four to eight sessions, like Mike just like cut through all that and knew immediately what was going on, what was wrong. Um, I, I had, one thing I had said right away was like, it's not abandonment issues because I'm adopted <laughs> and I had done lots of therapy around that. And so I was convinced that that was not what it was that we, I had resolved that because again, I had done tons of therapy, tons of types of treatment. And I was like, that's not the issue. But apparently Mike told me later that like my signals were all like, she's lying. <laughs> she thinks it's not this, but it is this. And so I don't know if you have any insight into that, Mike. Well, denial again, right? Just don't even know <laughs> I'm lying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you, I, I do remember that, that you, you stated emphatically to me that this has nothing to do with abandonment. But yes, you were in NLP terms, you were incongruent. So what your mouth was telling me was contradicting what your body was telling me. And so, so I knew that there, there was more there. And, you know, I, I think it's important to note here that you had done a lot of counseling. And, and in fact, my, my joke about Heather is, you know, sh you could finish my sentences and, and you, you could speak like a clinical psychologist, you know, so, so you, you, you could impress with the lingo that you could throw around but, but the real problem was, is even though you could finish my sentences, you were still suffering with, with that depression and anxiety. Yeah, I knew a lot. I had studied a lot. I had done a lot of work, but it didn't change that there was something inside that was not healed. Yeah. And um, was still, again, like we found out later when we worked on things that I did have a sabotage program that when I did get successful, my body and brain became afraid because it was, it knew how to be unhappy. It knew how to be not successful and anything outside of that comfort zone, it did not accept and would not let happen. Well, and, and maybe it's worth saying here that that fear and unhappiness was your comfort zone. That, that was, that was a certain type of energy that, that you were, you know, acquainted with um, through your childhood and through, through the circumstances that we'll discuss here in a few minutes. But it was the default place to go to. And, you know, and, and I, I, I mention this often to people that, that um, depression and anxiety, it comes with a stigma. And the, the stigma is typically, it, it doesn't matter what I do, I can't change this. And so I have to just accept that this is the way my life is. And, and the world will normally accept that. If, if you tell the world that that's the problem with you, then they'll accept that. And so everyone seems to accept that paradigm. And do you have anything to say towards that, Heather? Um, it, it is interesting because I, I feel like people are starting to change a little bit in understanding um, depression, and anxiety. Like when I was younger, my family didn't even want to talk about it. And again, I have a wonderful family. I just want to say that I have amazing family, amazing parents, but it wasn't something that was really talked about or acknowledged. And then even as I got older and tried to kind of work through it, it was something that like, if you told people about it, it kind of seemed like there was a stigma around it. And I feel like nowadays we're doing a better job of acknowledging it, but there is the danger of uh, letting it just drive your life that I don't think that having depression and anxiety means that then you just give up. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't want to, like I was giving up, but there was still a part of me that was fighting and was saying, this can't be my life. This but, can't be all there is for me in my life. Yeah. And, and like you said, when you showed up, you were, you were pretty much hopeless. And in, in that first meeting, you caught a glimmer of hope thinking that, you know, maybe this time it could be different. And it turns out it was different that time. It was. It was. You know, so you take another swing, you know, when you think that you can't hit the ball and, and it will go over the fence. And that's exactly what happened with you, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and even just, like I said, just the neurolinguistic programming, just that first session was really, really amazing because I knew that there was something broken inside of me, but I also knew it wasn't my fault. But when you've been depressed and anxious for so long, you start to blame yourself and people around you sometimes start to blame you too, because right. You set yourself up for success again and again, 
and it doesn't happen. And it's like, well, it must be me. Um, and again, later I learned that some of my programs were self-sabotaging, but again, if your brain has been conditioned and trained a certain way to think and believe you need help to break that and yeah. talk therapy while well, helpful. And I, I think it helped me get through some things. It didn't change the dialogue that was going on inside that kind of, or in the things that were going on behind the scenes that I had no control over. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I, I appreciate, I appreciate that perspective, Heather. And, and I'd also like to point out that, some of the things, you know, we talk about the programs that were written and, you know, maybe I can talk to that point for just a moment. You know, as, as we grow up in certain environments, there's, there are certain environmental factors that, that will affect us in, in really hidden ways. And so those dynamics can be captured and recorded in our subconscious realm and can also be hidden from us. And so some of these programs that you talk about, maybe, maybe it's important that we just elaborate on that a little bit for the listeners, that some of this uh, stuff that you were suffering from was beyond your conscious awareness. It, it's not like you could just pull it out and evaluate it. It was hidden from your, your paradigm or hidden from your perspective. Yeah. So I mentioned that I'm adopted and actually in my mid twenties, I reconnected with my birth mother and my birth family. And it was a very positive thing. Um, I had some up and downs in my own family again, where my parents wanted to help me, but things just kept falling apart, but I knew that they loved me. And I knew that once I connected with my biological family, they loved me. And that's why I felt kind of like I've, I should have healed all of this. But when we finally did our, it was the second session with Mike where we, we did some hypnosis and very quickly, once I got into that relaxed state where I could go past my beliefs and kind of see what was actually going on, um, I had this feeling that I was unloved and unwanted. And so it didn't matter how many positive affirmations I said, how much talk therapy I did, there was a program in my mind that I truly, truly believed that I wasn't wanted. And what it went back to, because we were we were discussing it and like Mike was asking me questions to kind of guide where I was and, and try to pull out the words. And what we discovered was that I was actually um, in my mother's womb, I, three months in the womb. And she was young and unmarried. And as anyone would in that situation, if they found out that they were pregnant, um, and hadn't planned for it. She was afraid. She was scared. And I, again, I don't fault her for that, but just, it was like a perfect storm of things where she felt she didn't want to have a baby. And for whatever reason, I imprinted on that. And my belief system, my core memory right there was that I was unwanted and I shouldn't even be alive. Yeah. And that belief system, of course, <laughs> shaped everything. And then unfortunately later, um, again, I had wonderful parents. They didn't know, but like through therapy with Mike, I was able to kind of go back. And again, a lot of people would say, oh, how can you really know? But but I knew, and there was a neighbor that at a very young age um, caused me a lot of pain and hurt me. And that only compounded what I believed about myself being unlovable, being unworthy, that I shouldn't be alive. and. Um, those things shaped how I perceived myself and all through my young life, I didn't understand love. I thought it was contractional, you know, like it was based on what you did. And so I had a very big perfectionist com complex. I believed I had to be perfect all the time. And I felt pressured and anxious all the time. And I didn't understand God's love. I didn't understand my family's love. I didn't know how to love myself, but I didn't realize these things right until the effects until in my teenage years, I started having depression and anxiety yeah. um, until in college, right. When like I kept falling apart when pressure was on um, mission, I got sick and depressed, you know, and, and I would always come back from things and like pick myself up again but this just kept happening over and over and over again and continued in my adult life. And 
And like I said, until Mike helped me kind of get deeper with the NLP and hypnosis, and then we actually started restructuring things. It wasn't just identifying them. It was, okay, now we're going to teach you to have positive associations, to have a different belief system that will help you and enable you rather than keep sabotaging you. Yeah, excellent. Do you mind if I loop back over a few things that you said there sure. that I find significant? Um, you know, this perfection, um, perfectionism that you were talking about, that you had this, this um, value system that you had to be perfect to prove that you had value. And so there was a pressure associated with living up to those expectations. And when you couldn't live up to those expectations, you, you know, it's like running an engine on, on high RPMs and then the engine seizes. It, it can't keep up with that pressure. <clears throat> Every time that you would fail, you would try and then you would fail. That became a reinforcing evidence of what? That I was worthless and I could never be perfect and I was unlovable. Yeah, that, that I'm unlovable. And, you know, so so I remember the day we did this hypnosis session. And maybe let me just point out a couple of points to, to set this up. With NLP, we have this, there's this concept called chunking down. And chunking down means let's be more specific. You know, so to people typically who are struggling with depression and anxiety and OCD and whatever else might be going on all at the same time. Collectively, it's like a big ball of tape, you know, that there's just several strands of tape just wrapped together and it, it feels overwhelming. It seems impossible to overcome. And so one of the things that I did with Heather is to separate that tape out, break it down into individual pieces. And the particular day that we did hypnosis where we arrived when Heather was three months in the womb, um, I, did, I remember specifically the type of hypnosis that I did with you that day. It's called regress to cause or regression to cause. And you have to go into a, to a deep level of hypnosis to really purely access that information. So again, this is something you cannot get to just through conscious speculation or, or theorizing or in, in Heather's case, um, she couldn't she couldn't solve that by simply understanding the psychological terms that would explain the phenomenon mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so so when i when I put Heather into hypnosis, um, she went just really beautifully into a nice deep hypnosis, a nice relaxed state and and then Heather started to have what we call an ab reaction where Heather started to squirm in her seat and started to get really upset. And so I established contact with her and I said, Heather, where are you? What's happening right now? And it probably took you maybe 10 seconds where you're like, it's dark. It's scary. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what's happening. And then suddenly it was just this quizzical statement that you said, oh, I'm, I'm in the womb. And so it, it's important to set this up because I asked your subconscious mind the question. I said, take me to the reason for the self-loathing. That was the specific question that I asked your subconscious yeah, mind. That's right. That was and, the thing I wanted to identify first. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, so I just want to point out here that, that the origins of Heather's self-loathing went all the way back to three months in the womb. And, and you, you know, you, you kind of talked past that point you said, but for some reason you imprinted on something that happened there. And the way I remember this, and please feel free to, you know, fill in, you know, the details around, around what I'm going to pre present here. Um, but, but you, uh, I remember you saying that your mother, she was an unwed teenager and in a religious environment, right? Mm -hmm. And at three months, she was three months pregnant and, and had just learned that she was pregnant. And so the shock and the dismay and the shame, <clears throat> it hit her like a wave of just, oh, no, what am I going to do? I don't want this baby. Mm -hmm. And so that emotional um, trigger that, that ran through her also ran through you. And so w would you mind talking to that point for a minute? Yeah, like as you're saying, I recall too that moment of realizing I was in the womb and then just feeling 
the emotions while I was in hypnosis, feeling the emotions that my birth mother felt, you know, and that, and again, in my conscious state, I can understand that. I think anybody would feel those emotions in that moment, but for whatever reason, it was so strong. And so, and I was, you know, maybe a sensitive soul. I've always been a sensitive soul. And I just, I absorbed that and just believed that utterly that I was unwanted. I shouldn't even be alive, you know, that I was unlovable. Yeah. And so it was more than just an idea. It was an emotional reaction that, that passed through your body. It passed through your mom's body. And it created, um, in NLP, we call that an imprint. You imprinted on that concept. Now, I, I want to point out another thing here, um, just, just to validate why and how you felt the way you did about yourself. Um, so I, I often joke around with, with some of my new clients. I, talk, I ask them if they like Chick-fil-A. And I'll, I'll, I always get a yes on that, by the way. And, and I asked them, I said, do you know why Chick-fil-A tastes so good? And they're like, well, I don't know. And the answer is because the, the chicken is marinated in pickle juice overnight. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, so, and so the concept of marination then is it absorbs the juice in, in the bowl, you know, and it draws it in. And so the idea is you can taste, you know, when you finally cook that chicken, every bite that you taste take, you can taste the pickle in it because it's mm -hmm. absorbed that pickle juice. And so that concept of marination is, is what I, I want to offer you as, as validation to what you went through. So not only did you go through that trauma of feeling instant dejection and rejection from your mother, but you lived in that trauma. So in other words, she was filled with dread, right? And so she decided to go through this process of, of being a teenage mother, and she decided that she was going to put you up for adoption. But that was a concept that you were marinating with while she was stewing over all of, all of these heart-wrenching decisions that she was going to have to make to, to give up this baby. And so, so it, not only were you affected with that um, with that impact of, of her being disappointed and scared and not wanting to have a baby, but, but living with the dread, right? And so, you, so you, you marinated through that whole experience while you were in the womb. And then when you were born, you really were put up for adoption. And so you were given away. And, and I, I, wanna, I wanna tell you that I, many times I've worked with, with adopted um, children or, or now adults looking back. And I've seen this theme come up often where, where essentially this adopted child will say to me, if my own mother didn't want me, if my own mother didn't want to be a part of my life, then what does that prove about me? Mm -hmm. And so, so you can kind of feel the heartstrings on that. It's, it's evidence of, of, you know, feeling unloved, right? Mm -hmm. And so we came face to face with, with that experience in, in, Heather's, in, in Heather's hypnosis session. And I, I, like to, I like to just point out here that, you know, we could have theorized about that, but to experience it was different, wasn't it? It was, yeah, to feel the emotions, to feel the strength of them. And, and again, I had theorized it, right? Because that's something that comes up sometimes with adopted children. Um, but it was different to go <clears throat> deep, deep into the hypnosis state and go back to those feelings and those emotions. And it was very emotional. Like I can talk about it right now and not be upset but like when I was there and feeling it it was very emotional and it was a very raw tender point that hurt a lot at that time yeah can, let me talk to that point for just a minute the fact that you can talk about that right now without having to relive that is an evidence of the success that we had with the work that we did mm -hmm. it became more objective and 
You know, one of the uh, attributes of the subconscious mind is it is void of rational perspective. And so the subconscious mind wants to hide that traumatic information from you. So that wall that separates the conscious from the subconscious wants to hide that information from you to protect you. And, and so therefore that information gets trapped into the dark recesses of your mind where there is no um, rational thought to be able to work through that. And so that's what we were able to do is it's, it's as if we were able to drill a tunnel back to that memory, a tunnel of consciousness that, yeah. that remained open, right? So we, we maintained mm -hmm. connection to that concept after we had ended that particular session. And from my perspective, what I was hoping to start accomplishing was to give you access to that information from the light of your consciousness. So you could revisit, so you could start thinking about that because essentially um, you, you experience that imprint, you marinated in that dejection and it, it started to form a cluster of beliefs and attitudes around feeling unlovable, feeling worthless, right? And, and the fact that you were given away and have, you know, you were given away uh, with adoption was was proof it was reinforcement that you weren't enough right and so that whole story needed to be put in the spotlight we needed to pull that over the wall and bring it into your conscious awareness so you could start contemplating that information from the light of your conscious mind and i think that's really beautiful too because um i actually think adoption is a wonderful thing like i have the most amazing family and, um, and I even know, because I, again, I've connected with my birth mom and we've talked and she felt very inspired that I wasn't hers and that the right choice was to send me to another family. And, but it's interesting that I think that with adoption, that's something that parents have to kind of be aware of, that there might be some abandonment issues. There might be some stories, but that's the beauty of with NLP and hypnosis that we were able to, nobody wanted me to feel those things. Nobody, even though like emotions might've been felt, you know, vividly, like nobody wanted me to keep those emotions and it wasn't serving me. And so being able to finally address those on a deep enough level that I could heal from them was really, really important. Yeah. And, and healing from, from them, really started with rec conscious recognition and a willingness to rethink that story that you had marinated in all of those years. And can I just also point out, you know, I've met your family, you know, I've, I've worked with your parents before and um, just great people. And, and maybe just wanted to point out here that the love <clears throat> that they had to offer you still wasn't enough to heal that void that was in your life. It was beyond their reach as well. And maybe you can just talk to that point. Does that prove that they weren't good enough parents or, or what, what, what no. did we say? What did we figure out? <laughs> right. I mean, and, and we're all imperfect and, you know, like I, I, in a later therapy NLP session that I did with um, Mike, one time my mom yelled at me and that became a really big deal to my little tiny Heather self, you know, and it's like, everyone's going to have those moments and sometimes you don't know the ones that are going to become absorbed and become negative, right? Programs, which is why, again, that's the beauty of hypnosis therapy and NLP is identifying what your specific things are. And, um, and that can be done even in visualizing and group sessions, right? But like, but finding out what yours are, because while there's common themes for everybody, my specific one was very specific to my life and my experience, but my parents are wonderful. That's one of the things that I've gained um, by working with Mike is I was able to get back that healthy, loving relationship with my parents that I wanted to have and I wanted to feel and they wanted me to feel. But for whatever reason, these programs, these belief systems was blocking me from being able to feel those things. Or, or even stated differently because of the programming that occurred at such a young stage of your development, there were just, there were certain skills that you didn't have the opportunity to develop yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
uh, and I, I want to talk about that right now because you know you came to me you know as as a young woman you know you had you had already grown up through your teenage years and um, you still hadn't learned those skills you had learned you know rather than learning the skills of self love um, you had learned a counterfeit called perfectionism. You know, there's a, there's a phrase that I use to explain perfectionism. It, it's a it's a conflict uh, pattern that I learned in in NLP that's called human being versus human doing. And so the human doing part, as long as I do these things, then I have value. But if I can't do them, if I fail to do them, then it pulls the value down. And so my value is always contingent, right upon upon my efforts. And so we were able to, to, to ba basically create a new blueprint. And, and you were the one that got to decide what that blueprint was gonna be, right? It wasn't me that decided what was gonna be best for you. It was you to actually start creating a blueprint and exploring, <clears throat> if I don't want to live under that, that concept of perfectionism that always lets me down, I wonder what would work better. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about earlier about like leaving it a little open, like bringing it into the conscious mind. Yeah. And one thing then I was able to go and and ruminate on these things and think about it and um, doing some of the technology that is available either through, you know, um, we have, I think you still have those, the small devices, right? Yeah. And yeah, I, I can explain that. So in fact, um, the audio is called audio visual entrainment. And let me just say that if you want to learn more about that um, outside of this conversation, you can go out to my website, mikesimpson.live, and and I'll I'll put some additional information because I've had some questions come in since um, Lindsay did this as well. So Lindsay also talked about the theta chamber and mm -hmm. specifically with the audio visual entrainment. So so you can go ahead and um, just yeah. So continue. I at the time we had the big theta chamber, but I still use the the personal devices. Yeah. which are available and um and, and, and when i was they, they help you induce hypnosis yeah uh, that's just yeah. important to say that it'll it'll change your body chemistry and place your your brain waves into theta into so, the theta state yeah. so it takes you into this deep place where you're kind of in a conscious dreaming type state yeah. and so mike and i again talked about this what happened the the false belief systems brought them to awareness, you know, that, that the feelings that I had like imprinted on and I didn't want those, but when our session was over, he kind of left it open, like, okay, well, we'll, we'll continue this next time. And I went into the, the theta chamber. I went into the theta state. And it was while it was I was immediately, there, immediately after this session, Yep. Heather, yeah, Heather, it was immediately her, next, after. her next half an hour was 30 minutes in the theta chamber, which was going to induce hypnosis and take her right back to where we had just left off. Yeah. And, and we both kind of had the feeling that like, oh, we're going to keep working on this. But I went into the theta chamber just thinking of those things. And while I was there, I had like a vision of I saw myself um, dark and black and just feeling all of these negative things and i was like i don't i don't want this anymore this is this isn't helping me nobody else wants me to have this i i don't want this feeling and um so then i visualized my birth mother standing on one side of me and i took her hand and I visualized my birth father on the other side of me, who I haven't met. I, I don't know him, but, you know, just visualize these things and said, turn to one and said, I know that what you went through was hard, but I'm not going to carry your pain anymore. And, you know, turn to the other and I said, I know what you went through was confusing, but I don't want these feelings. And then I visualized them turning into a butterfly which is a significant thing for me. I've always loved butterflies and it was a purple butterfly, my favorite color. <laughs> and so the blackness faded into this beautiful purple butterfly and it flew away. And as it flew away, I felt a lot of that heaviness and self-loathing float away as well. And yeah. it made a big difference. It, it really was a self-healing thing. Like we, we had other things to work on and, and some, again, programs that had kind of been based on those programs later I built other programs 
but that was a huge turning point for me right then because I was able to let go of that feeling of worthlessness and un- being unlovable that wasn't even mine. And I was able to finally release it. And I remember what you said in, in that vision, because I talked to you right after that happened. And, and in that experience, you also, you also said to your birth mother and birth father, I'm not a mistake. I am a blessing. Do you remember that? Right, I did. I did. I wanted to switch it to, I'm not a mistake. I'm a blessing. And I, and I said, I forgave them, you know, for being human, for having human emotions. And yeah, that was kind of the thing that kept repeating was I'm not a mistake. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a miracle. I think I even said, you know, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, that's amazing. And so what I want to point out here is once we drilled a tunnel of consciousness to that concept, we, uh, we, we basically set an intention to start addressing it, to start thinking about it, to start working on it. So it's just nice to say, like, even right now today, this conversation that we're having could possibly uh, bring some insight and perspective to someone else who's been through a similar thing. And so it's just important that the first step in healing is setting the intention to heal. And, it, and it's also, it's, it's about courage, isn't it, Heather? You had to, you had to have courage to step out of dysfunction because there was this pressure of perfectionism. It's, it's, and it was basically stating this, if I can't be perfect and I step away from this and I try again and I fail, you know, then I'm afraid that failing again is going to be more than I can handle. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And it was an impossible standard. It was an unachievable standard that constantly kept me in, sadness and dysfunction that's right it it was a limiting belief that i have to be perfect with everything i do all of the time so that everyone else can see that i have value and so it's it's it's, it was not only you know when, when we started to you know chunk down and to look at these pieces i remember specifically thinking how impossible that would be to to maintain that standard it isn't possible. It's not realistic and it's no way to live your life. Mm-hmm. And so, so then the question is, if perfectionism isn't the answer, then what is? Right. And so we have to be, be able to build some type of a value system and a philosophy that can supplant that old notion of perfectionism. And it's, it's probably worth pointing out here, you know, a lot of my listeners are religious a lot of my clients that come to me are religious and this, this perfectionism concept really can affect people. You know, if I, if I can't be perfect, then I'm not going to try anymore. What's the point anyway. And frankly, I I hear sometimes, you know, I'm going to go to hell anyway. So what does it matter? Right. Yeah, it did. It affected how I felt about myself, about religion, about God. Um, And it's, it's a, pervasive thing because it's taking something an idea that we hear in some religions right that we should strive for perfection but taking it to a toxic level yeah it's unachievable and and a a tool of just self-abuse and that's not the intent so I, i want you to listen to this phrase i heard one of my instructors at an advanced hypnosis course make this comment i want to say it to you and tell me what it means to you so it, it was addressing the perfectionism concept. And what he, he stated was, I'm not perfect, but I'm good enough today. I'm not perfect, but I'm good enough today. <laughs> See how congruent you were? Very good, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's achievable, right? That's realistic. Um, and that's something I feel like because it was ingrained in me, I have to sometimes catch myself still because it's, it's something that was so much part of my life and my value system for so long. Um, but being able to get to that core belief and, and heal that was huge. And um, one time I, it wasn't Mike, but I had another therapist. Uh, uh, Cause again, I, I gained good things from these good people, but one thing he talked about was, you know, it, it wouldn't be fair with all the, the 
bad that can happen in life with all the pain and the suffering and things that other people do that affect us. It wouldn't be fair if there was no way to heal from those things. And I believed that. And so it was a huge relief to finally find healing. That it, I, it did I love exist. that. I love that, that he installed an empowering belief inside of you that it wouldn't be fair. And so, so you held on to that hope. And eventually that did lead to healing, didn't it? It did. You know, it did that we should be able to heal from the pain and the heartache and the sadness and the false beliefs because we want to be the best that we can be even now. And we want joy now. Yeah. Well, I'd like to share a really profound insight that, that I've encountered often with, with, with people that are trying to live up to a religious standard, but have never developed the skills to actually learn how to love themselves. And so the, there's this concept where um, as soon as I can make myself perfect, you know, then I'll be worthy to approach God. And, you know, I, I just think it's interesting that we're getting the cart before the horse here. We're getting things backwards because the Savior, he taught that, that he is the physician. And so if, if you swap that out and, and you use that, that mindset, I, I basically say, I have to make myself healthy before I'm worthy to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. and, and the physician is for those who are sick. And so if, if you switch that around, you can basically say, you can employ God's help in, in becoming better. And, and we can't do that without God. And, and it's, it's my position that we can't heal without God. And, yeah. but, but here's that was the a big part of my healing too, that, definitely. That, and, um, oh, shoot, I had a thought. And then it kind of flew away. Go ahead with what you were saying. I'll see if it comes well, back. <laughs> yeah, and, and feel free to just to jump in if, if you get it back. But we cannot heal without God. But if we have limiting beliefs that have become established through our environment that tells us we're, we're not worthy of God, then we actually have a built-in resistance to God. And that's what we call unbelief. And so I've got these faulty belief systems that are alienating me away from God. They're isolating me away from God. And, and then I have this false notion that I have to make myself perfect to be worthy to be with God. To, to worthy to have God's help. And so I, I really just want to emphasize that point is one of the most important takeaways from today's conversation is the Lord is the physician. And often he's unable to help us because our own limiting beliefs, which I call unbelief, our limiting beliefs can actually prevent him from being able to come in and heal us. And, you know, sometimes that can happen with, with the trauma that we've been through. So, you know, Heather, you have a valid reason for being upset, you know, being brought into this world and, and those unfavorable circumstances. Um, you know, not everyone gets tripped, tripped out of the starting chute like you were. And, you know, and has to go through that kind of experience early on in life. And you could indulge in, in pity. You could, you could use that as justification to stay angry with God. And, and what I have found is if you're upset for valid reasons and you're clinging on to those reasons, then it is impossible to heal because you're occupying your heart with this anger and this blame and this, this dark energy. And working with Mike at the center for a couple of years, we would see that sometimes that there were people who maybe in their conscious mind wanted to heal, but they weren't willing to let go of the anger yet. And yeah. Mike couldn't force anybody to heal. And Mike right. does use faith-based practices. And, and so for some people that wasn't a good fit, you know? And so there were people who would hold on to their anger and frustration and, or even the safety net, right. Of, yeah. Just how I talked about, like, it was comfortable to be in depression and anxiety. It was comfortable to be sick. That was another program we found that my, my brain and body kind of knew if I was getting overwhelmed and I was getting scared, oh, I'll make her sick. Because if she's sick, 
she can't do things. And then everyone starts taking care of her. And, and that was a fault. big false program. Yeah. And it, and it was important to, to acknowledge there too, that, that you would get sick and it would be outside of your control. So it's not my fault. And so it, it becomes an acceptable safety net or an acceptable hiding place, mm-hmm. but, but it breeds complacency. If, if I learned to just accept that story that this is as good as it's going to get, and I'm never going to get better then then in some ways, if I can convince everyone else around me that this is as good as it's going to get and they, they will accept that, then I can I can live in that hiding place. And and by the way, if I do choose to live in that hiding place, often that's called depression. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I would get physical symptoms and sometimes even now, like I'll catch my body, <laughs> like throwing out these sickness signals and I have to kind of evaluate, okay, is this that I'm sick or is this that I'm scared of something? And I have to kind of reevaluate and look at things and challenge my brain and belief systems. Because again, for years, that was a coping strategy that my body and brain knew was like, if I do this, then she'll stop trying to do these things that are stressing her out. And I don't want to live that way anymore. I refuse to live that way anymore. But it is interesting that your, your brain is, is, it knows how to do, um, it knows lots of tricks <laughs> to, yeah. to stop you when it's afraid. <laughs> well, Heather, it's amazing talking to you today. And as we're, we're running out of time and getting ready to wrap up here today, but I just want to talk about what, you know, how, how fulfilling it is for me to have this conversation with you today to see how far you've come, you know, and it's I'm really yeah. happy. I'm really doing well. I mean, I loved the time that I worked at Theta. It was wonderful. I was happy to share my story and help others. But when it was time to move on, um, I felt, and that's what I was going to say earlier that I kind of flew away. I really feel that I was guided by God to the Theta Center, that I was ready for that type of healing. I was open to it. I was, I was ready. And then afterwards, um, I was a little bit worried about what's next but I'm in a job right now that I love in a situation with really healthy, good friends and a really good relationship with my family. And um, I just, you know, still feel that hope that things can just keep getting better as I get better at managing um, and having good belief systems and realistic um, goals in my life. Well, it, it's just amazing, you know, to, to acknowledge God's hand and in our lives, you know, as, as we made the jump, you know, we walked away from a different career. You know, I used to be a software engineer and, and we moved over to, to, to do Theta Wellness full time and it was a scary jump and we felt God nudging us to do that. And we had no idea what we were in for, but, but Heather was, was one of those reasons why, why we went and, and ran at that wellness center. When, when COVID came around, I, 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 was it in 2019, um, where, where we had to shut down the wellness center? I can't remember what year it was. 20, 2020. <laughs> was it 2020? Yeah. So, so, so that was really just an interesting time because we had gone through this amazing era. Of, we had witnessed so many healing miracles and just profound changes. And, and yet it was in the cards that the wellness center was going to close down and it was a difficult time, but it was really amazing where Heather, I got to witness Heather having learned her new skill set. So not only did we go through her healing process at the wellness center, but also her working with us helped us to move to that next level of success. And Heather helped us manage the chaos. And it was chaotic, wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> yeah. There's there a were, lot of things to keep track of and <laughs> people to help. And <laughs> yeah, there, there were, it's in some of those times I was booked out three months in advance. Mm-hmm. And so if I would get sick, boy, it was going to be, it was going to be a challenge to figure out how to get to these people. And uh, there was, there was a tremendous demand because word was getting out that people were getting better. And, but still at the end of that era, when we closed down the wellness center, um, you know, Heather was facing all of this uncertainty and my wife and I um, got to witness Heather jump from the nest and fly with her wings, <laughs> which was really amazing, right? Yeah. Because it was a scary time because you had become competent working with us. You were very effective and, and very busy. 
but you had learned how to flourish in that little bubble at our wellness center. But look what you've accomplished since, since then. You, you've gone on and you've become a professional, a successful. Um, you're making a huge difference to children um, as a teacher. And so I just want to tell you that uh, how proud um, Di and I are of you and, and thankful that, that you would come back and have this conversation with us. Um, because we want to tell the stories now. We want people to listen to you. We want them to feel inspired by what really happened to you and, and maybe lay the, the groundwork for them to get ready to create their own miracle. And so th these conversations really make a difference. Yeah. And it is, it's, it changed my life. It changed the course of everything and really put me on the path where I can be successful and, and not be self-sabotaging and be able to enjoy life. And, and that, I mean, challenges still come up, right? And I, I still have to keep working at it, but I have the tools now to handle those things. And I don't have that baggage that was creating so much um, anger and frustration and sorrow and, and fear and, and living all the time constantly with that in my head was so hard. And I don't have that. I have a lot more peace That's and right. I have the ability to, take on hard things and deal with them without falling apart. And that's just such a blessing. Well, you know, what's amazing is what you have now is called resilience. You're like a basketball that has air pressure. And when, when you drop it, it bounces back up to your hands. And so it, it's not a life without problems. None of us have that, but it's a life with a skill set that you've now developed that you neglected to develop through your childhood but you've now developed as an adult that, that serves you well and allows you to, to play a significant role in the lives of children, you know? And so, so you're able to give what you weren't given, you know, in, in your youth and through, through God's help and grace, you, you've been able to become part of the answer instead of part of the problem. So, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Well, Heather, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we're excited for the listeners to, to be able to hear your story. And, and um, maybe we'll have you back with a follow-up conversation. Hopefully we'll get some There was questions. a lot. <laughs> we had to work on a lot. <laughs> we did. We covered a lot. But, but the uh, points that you did bring up created profound insights for some of our listeners. And that's really the goal. And it's for those out there who are listening to Heather, this is a real life story. This really happened for her. And, and she really has moved into a new paradigm, a new world. And she's able to look back on past trauma without having to relive it. So she's able to live in a different paradigm altogether now. So thank you for joining us, Heather, and, and looking forward to more conversations to come. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of for those of you who uh, enjoyed this conversation, we just ask that you press the subscribe button. We're going to be having many conversations. Um, this is a time to do the talking. And so we're excited to have you join us. So please press subscribe and, and join with us.